Hello, uh, welcome to episode four of Joe Black Meets. Um, I am going to attempt to make this intro short because this is a long episode. It's a jumbo episode because as Camille explained to me, she is Irish, she is from Cork and she loves a chat. Uh, and I am, I'm so, so happy uh, to have spoken to Camille for this. Um, we'd met very briefly before uh, very casually, never really interacted, um, but I am such a fan of this uh, artist and this woman. I've got a cat. That's. Do you want to hear the purring? Go on. Oh no, he's just that was him rubbing himself uh, across the microphone. I thought we'd get a lovely purr. Uh, <laughs> I am such a fan of this woman. Um, please, if you are not familiar, search for Camillo Sullivan on YouTube and 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 Spotify her album uh Changeling she is phenomenal um and 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 very very inspiring uh and I was so pleased to be able to have this chat so yes enjoy this jumbo episode of Camillo Sullivan uh weaving some wonderful tales um at the time of the release Camillo Sullivan will have just started her show Dreaming at the Edinburgh Fringe Festival so if you are there please go see it and if you would like something to do later in the year, of course, this podcast at the time of recording has no advertisements on it. So, uh, you know, I don't make any money. This is all for the love of it. So if you want to support me somehow, buy a T-shirt, uh, some merch or come see me on tour later in the year in October and November with my shlo- uh, my shlo- my show Club Cataclysm uh, touring the UK and Ireland. Right. My intro is too long for the length of this episode, but make yourself a nice cup of tea, sit back, and listen to the lovely tones of the glorious Camillo Sullivan. Hello, Camillo Sullivan. Hello, darling Joe. How are oh, you? I'm all right. We are, for the, obviously people can't see us, we are in a vintage cinema bus uh, on a roundabout at Brighton Fringe. It is May. This is probably coming out in the summer, so yep. May is long gone. You are now at Edinburgh Fringe. Yeah. And um, it is amazing in this little cinema room. I wish we could <laughs> live here forever. We should move the shows here. There's not as many seats. No, not it's... Many. There's like eight. Yeah, about 16. It's absolutely good. gorgeous. I was looking at it from the outside, and now I'm like, I want one of these. The outside doesn't do it justice. No, I mean, <laughs> it doesn't, but it's it's definitely, you know, I've never seen anything like it. What is it, 16? It looks like little um, 1930s little seats, and you're looking amazing too, so I'm oh, delighted to be amazing. here. You're looking amazing. You've well, got a lovely embroidered bomber jacket <laughs> on, a red dress, the shoes are gone. <laughs> uh, right, so, uh, yes. for, those, for those of you who may not know uh, your work, how yep. would you describe yourself? What do you do? Um, I suppose I sing... I sing other people's songs. I try and interpret them instead of make them like a tribute. And I, um, uh, I suppose all these years happening, coming from Ireland where it's all about the singer songwriters, I was kind of embarrassed for not writing songs, but I'm, I'm kind of a performer. And, and what I do in my shows is when I first started was taking the likes of kind of Jacques Brel and Kurt Vile and those kind of stories and it allowed you to become a different character in every song. And then later it was my mum who said, well, look at your record collection. What you really love is like Nick Cave and the Beatles and David Bowie, and you've always been singing Moon Age Daydream. And aren't they the same kind of songs? And I was like, oh yeah, they are. So that brought me into the world of Bob Dylan and Radiohead and Leonard Cohen. So it's an, I suppose in a way I've been I know this is, I'm from Cork, a village in Ireland, so excuse me if I go off on a tangent and talk too much. Tangents are very welcome. Ta- okay, cool, that's good, because you'll get a few of them. But basically, um, I think I like becoming something else, and maybe that's the thing of having a certain 
social anxiety in my own life as a person and a shyness which allows you to become anything and multiplied by 100%. What it does to you though in the end, uh, it brings people on a kind of a, an unusual journey because they think you're just a singer first and um, and then you can bring them into kind of little different vignettes and become, allows you as a woman to be vulnerable and angry and funny and so change yourself very quickly. And I only have to deal with that after stage. I'm highly embarrassed about <laughs> everything I did. And people going, your dancing was great. And you're like, what dancing? <laughs> so, I dance. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, I, like the show we're doing at the moment isn't that. That's uh, The one is kind of it's a bit more basic, just about singing songs you love. But that's the long answer to kind of um, what I do, you know. <laughs> See, I was, I was, so I was ready for you to just say singer. And then I was going to go, hold up. <laughs> You are not. Oh, sugar. And I was going to come in. That. No, I'm, gl- I'm glad you said it. I thought you were just going to sort of go, ooh, a uh, uh, singer. I was like, no, you are not. You are a conduit for storytelling. You are a sorceress. Um, I was going to go Aww. off on what you did it for me and so, so beautifully. Um, that brought to mind many things there. But yeah. what I, one thing that really struck me was... Uh, you said that you be- you become these characters yeah. and sort of bigger, and then the list of names that you picked, yeah. maybe with the exception to David Bowie, who's yeah. very, very, very yeah. showy. Yeah, yeah. Uh, all of the ones you mentioned are actually quite um, reserved or like normal yeah. people that are, are brought to life by their music. Like Tom, Tom York yeah. is not uh, a particularly showy person, no. I don't think, yeah. but the, the music is so theatrical and so big. Radiohead, for those of you unfamiliar with yeah. Tom York. Um, <laughs> Nick Cave, again, uh, very very tall, yeah. uh, shadowy figure, yeah. but is a, a perfectly normal man. Yeah. Uh, but then on stage is this, this almost priest-like figure. Yes, and, and Tom yeah. Waits has more of a, like a mythos yeah. uh, uh, surrounding he'd ha- it. He'd have more of the the kind of carny I, I suppose he's amazing he's like the left hand side of life or and uh, he for the hobos or for the down and outs and uh, I, I think all of them have something where they can write the most beautiful love songs or lullabies ever but they also can do the kind of darker um, melancholic kind of um, the wheels are coming off, which is maybe suitable for how I feel about my own life. Uh, <laughs> and I may be resisted for a long time because I think when I first started, it was all about being enigmatic on stage and hiding, probably speaking in between, because I found that the most terrifying thing to do is reveal yourself. And as my friend said later, a very good friend said, you're quite eccentric. I said, why did you share the madness you have? I said, OK. And now that's why, like last night, I'm there going, um, talking nonstop. Um, but I suppose there's, there's a thing in those artists um, as a, being a you know, woman or whatever, you bring that side out of a song. But there's, a, as you said, there's a character in, to inhabit. Mm-hmm. So, you know, and I, I think I love all of them as performers, too. I like each person, Leonard Cohen, Bob Dylan, for all different reasons, like the genuineness and authenticity of like Leonard Cohen. And I remember Fergal and I, Fergal, who plays, he's kind of my long term collaborator my suffering collaborator <laughs> um but uh he's uh, you know we went to see cohen and we were both kind of in tears just at the beauty of him in the simplicity of his singing so you you kind of zone in on different people and i suppose the thing is even if you are being really dramatic um for me it's always about something that moves me in a song to laugh or cry and so i want to kind of own that song and i want to get some truth out of it and as the years have gone by kind of the worse my relationships have been, the better a singer became because then you totally, you know, immerse yourself in that song to kind of like sometimes work through your own life on stage. Some of the songs are about totally connecting with the audience and some of the sadder songs, which I probably, if I had a chance, I'd do all the sad songs, but then people be on the floor <laughs> crying all the time. So that's why you do In These Shoes and give them some joy. But it's, it's kind of sometimes... Uh, you're thinking about things about your own life so what's nice is sometimes when people say oh did you write it or and you go oh oh, no so that's it's not what you're intending to do but I think for me because I don't have the thing of 
writing mine, I have to own it very much in a different way. And I suppose also as the years go by, if the song doesn't mean anything to you anymore, you just have to throw it out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, because some songs own you. And then I'll say to the band, do I sound like a wedding singer? Or do I sound, you know, because when I first started, I had to make a bit of money doing the wedding songs. The granny's like flying into the drum kits and all the rest <laughs> and getting the uncles up to sing. Um, but it, so you, songs find you. And, um, and then you spend your time in a show going, well, I want to uh, reveal this or I, I want to show that side and I want to change it really quickly to take people out of that world. And the only thing that frustrates me, I realise, you know, many times I've gone, oh, I wish I was just a singer on a chair singing a song, but oh, Jesus, I've chosen like the Mercy Seat or Staggerly or God is in the, like God is in the House as an opener is a beautiful song, but it's a tough one because you can see people in the front row going, Mavis, this is not what I thought it was going to be. <laughs> and you go, unfortunately, Mavis, there's something in me that makes me have to start shows in this kind of way of, prov- I suppose like theatre when you provoke people mm. and the uh, and and try and make them uh, think or question things, which is kind of coming from that old, German Cabri way of like you know uh, well it's not easy listening is it it's not and my sister does say Camille you could have made you know you could have done that greatest hits of Doris Day and stuff and I was going why didn't I think of that but and and, and the other thing sorry I meant to say was what it reminds me of is probably like you know when some people go well why would you do that you go well why does some an actor an actress take Lady Macbeth and why is there hundreds who try and make to um, you know take a monologue or do something and try and make it their own Mm -hmm. so that's kind of how I see those uh, when I hear some of those songs I kind of hear the lyric and the story first before I even know what the musical Mm -hmm. and so then I'm wandering around kind of saying it to myself and um, and some songs like what's funny is like I might have heard them 20 years ago and it isn't until now that I'm getting my head around maybe how some come very Mm -hmm. quickly and other ones like Ship Song is a song a lot of people love now and I think it took us two years because I just didn't know how to break the spell of Nick Cave's interpretation <laughs> you know it was his one I liked the most and um, I switched playing with a guy I work with two Kian and the typical way we break his songs down is sometimes just to do chords and make it quite hymnal and then you sing speak it and then you find a way or you slow it so um, right, so you're sort of like taking them all apart because mm. I don't you know I, I think when I when I learn stuff, I'll just go, okay. Well, I'll give it a go on the piano and yeah. see how it feels. I that I like this process of taking it into like the smallest pieces and then because yeah. you were you trained as an architect, yeah. Uh, and I had um, I watched an interview with you where you said that you approach songs like an architect yeah. and you build uh, build build the song in that way. Yeah, it's like I suppose when you're an architect, you're thinking of. <clears throat> Uh, what's the emo- like to me I suppose being Irish and half French there's a lot of emotion in me as a person I react and you know not that I spend my days crying but you know I <laughs> I do like to think that when you go into a place um, or when you you know what does that make you feel uh, do you feel protected do you feel happy do you feel uh, wondrous you know it's a bit like playing the Spiegel tent or seeing a beautiful you know we talked about the Union Chapel like uh, some places you're swimming in the building because it's so incredible as a singer just to even look at it mm-hmm. and, and when you go and see a, a gig there so I suppose as an architect it was always about like so you leave that space and then what does the next one do and what does uh, is that like a vast uh, experience or does that connect you to flowers or you know is it so it's different things that you try and create like um the senses um and not saying that um i suppose with singing it's it's that journey of like um i don't think you need to have a story to you know get you from a to b in a gig i think you can just change very slightly to become a different person in a song some songs I always find with ballads I don't like moving an inch I actually find that ir- irritates me a little because I want to just live and like really say those words because they're so important and then other songs I like to just abandon myself over <laughs> like and so most of the time falling over the monitor like some of my best gigs <laughs> are when the people have said they've heard the audience go <gasps> like this and I'm like lying on the ground going what's going on and they say and she kept on singing and I'm (laughs) going you know so 
I, you know, I, all those things that used to really embarrass me as a singer, like, you know, uh, people seeing, you know, like the worst sides of you, are you falling over, I actually realised those were the bits that made the audience come to you because they realised uh, not infallible, possibly mm-hmm. as crazy as I am, also on the way out and <laughs> having a laugh at herself. So things that, you know, I mean, I... Uh, sorry, I kind of left where we were talking from, but I, I think the thing of, like, uh, when I... Probably because, you know, years ago I'd learned piano, but I can't play it like you. I can only do it like basically. So I don't have an instrument to help me sit down. So all I have is me thinking of what that song is. So uh, sometimes you, you, it was a bit like Revelator, which is on the Changing album. I used to be in Edinburgh getting ready at the bottom of the um, hill, had to climb up to the mound. It was a half an hour journey. And I listened to Gillian Welch's like I'm kind of OCD I like to do the same thing and put the eye makeup on the left eye first and then you know I don't know at the moment I'm kind of like everything has been abandoned <laughs> in that regard but I used to listen to Revelator until it happens the moment I gotta sing it I just have to and then you put the tape away and then you start singing it to yourself and then you ring Fergal and you go let's try it like this and then you work with great musicians who can like he and I even though you know it's a long friendship we kill each other we do you know have a kind of way of being able to converse which came across a little when we did the Shakespeare thing we didn't really know we could do stuff like orchestrate things together but then we realized all the years of taking songs apart and putting the back that we had this thing going and you know I like most of the time I think oh Jesus have I don't know what I'm doing or I think it (laughs) I knew early on having nerves and stuff was a frustrating thing but also knew it would be a good thing because it meant you never felt you landed or you're like mm-hmm. secure so it means you're s- eternally searching and you know it's um, I suppose it's a child's curiosity you want to bring um, on stage and uh, that's what I have to remind myself sometimes when I'm looking at stuff again you know um, and I, even during COVID I found out like I thought Jesus take me two years to find five songs it's not like you know have I <laughs> come on Nick Cave get some more out there for me you know but it, it's not easy finding them it's like I always think I'm fishing for gold or yeah, salmon I, you know I mean with, with COVID I guess that you, you were at home so you could just sit there and listen to me mm. but it's not the same thing no you, 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 you occasionally want that I mean, I find it, I'll have, you know, Spotify on or something. Yeah. Uh, not sponsored by Spotify. <laughs> um, any other streaming platforms are available. Um, I'll, I'll have a streaming platform on. And uh, I'll be listening to one particular thing yeah. and then it, it throws up the, the random ones. Yeah. And I'll be listening to something and sometimes I will yeah. just stop. Yeah. And go, oh, oh, what's this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, because it was related to... Yeah, to, to I should or, do that more often because sometimes it's on, like... Might say my daughter is eight and she listens things, or Aiden, my partner, he might something, and then I go, "What is that?" And it is exciting. Like I'm there with my bloom and Shazam in restaurants, trying to climb. <laughs> like they're like, "What are you doing? Oh, yeah. Climbing up to the?" It's very or like you know, a closed door, and they're like, "Please come down." <laughs> and you're like, "I've got to hear what that song is." And it is like, um, you know. I don't know when the COVID thing happened. It was like a natural. Like I was pretty wrecked when touring, and so was the band. And it was a weird thing. I don't know if you felt that as a performer. Like usually the moment you're always like, Jesus, I have to take the next gaze. I've got to keep going. I've got to keep going. And the f- absolutely empathy and feeling for anybody that was going through a terrible time. But as a performer, it was a relief because you went, nobody else is gigging. Mm-hmm. I'm not gigging. Nobody's doing it. Not even the cat is singing. It's fine. I'm here. You know, and so it was a it was a weird thing because you've always been on high alert to kind of like make sure mm-hmm. you're six months ahead you've got a yep. gig coming and then nothing and then the months that passed and then how hard it was in going well not how hard but god what is it i do what you know i've forgotten what that is and i always knew falling off the horse would be hard i always mm-hmm. knew i always thought to myself i've kept going because if i stopped i'm scared i won't go back on mm-hmm. and when we did the two years and then you did also i was kind of very pleasantly surprised when there was, you know, uh, what was it, celebrities and everything. It, the whole thing kind of died and, uh, away, like, you know, that it was, that wasn't important. And NHS workers were, and the postman was important. And the girl working in Tesco and I was going, you know, this is real stuff. And um, then suddenly, you must be really looking forward to going back and perform. And you're like, hmm, I don't <laughs> think so. And the cat's looking and you go, you better leave this house soon. You know, so it was a kind of, I'm still in that mid uh, no man's land of, 
I am so happy to see people and you know when you see people who've come to your gigs before but there's a big kind of I loved being at home cleaning my mm -hmm. kitchen for a very long <laughs> time. <laughs> I think secretly a lot of performers really enjoyed it because I think a lot a lot of people went I wish I could have some time off mm. but then you would never take it off because yep. again you you're, yep. you're keeping on the horse keeping on the horse. Yeah. And then it happened and you went oh okay. Yeah. Um did did you find that you discovered more things creatively or did you kind of walk like step back from it for the time uh, I mean you've I got a you've got a kid so I guess it, yeah it, the well priorities yeah are very and she's different. very yeah absolutely and she's theatrical in her own right though she <laughs> is similar to me in the sense she doesn't like singing in front of people she knows or parties or she likes singing around me but if it was in school it, and it, it's a similar thing I don't like doing it like I would be terrified of like family occasions or I, I, I you know what I mean like so I was like people go you know when Covid was I, I kind of I I think in our our wonderful mad life is quite you know I started not knowing what was my real life and my you know my stage life because my stage life was becoming more my real life as I was touring and so to just kind of find me again and try sewing or making the banana bread or whatever it was and um, buying a tent for the back garden to create a little <laughs> festival for Lila with festoon lights and trying to make it a magical place at home like there was one room we just have like a disco ball on and I mean that turned out actually I, I there was loads of times I was asked by people to um, sing kind of like uh, those zoom things now I did a few charities because I thought this is the time like which I was doing over the years anyway but I was like, oh, God, do I want to be sitting at a table? And, you know, and, you know, also, you're not, you know, I was I delighted myself in not wearing makeup. I was like, this is such freedom. And being in the same dressing gown, which now I brought on the stage and uh, which I love the the reaction of T take that disastrous thing off. <laughs> Leave it on. It's like my dressing gown. I love it. And I am. Um, I uh, I liked that. And then was, I thought, oh, no, I won't do the, I suppose the creative thing that happened is I learned how to edit film and because Fergal and I had to, were at a distance of like he was like four and a half hours drive away from me when we had to record a kind of Van Morrison song for his uh, everybody was doing it for his birthday and it we nearly killed each other because it took about two weeks even to just work <laughs> out the chords because we weren't with each other but th this thing I did for Court Midsummer was kind of losing yourself in lockdown and I said look I'd love to do it but I'd love to do it like a day in the life and maybe it was kind of inspired a little by Tom Waits um, kind of big time vid video which is very hard to find online but I've it's been, him I've in the been, I've been it's, trying to it's so find good if it. I think I can find out I'll send it to you because he's like in his bathtub with like the, the umbrella on it's on fire like you're going yep that's all the things I love <laughs> and so the the idea was waking up in the morning and singing the songs and so some was uh, you know it, uh, waking up in your bed and then going down uh, putting your curlers on and singing sad waters in a little laundry room and then cleaning uh, hoovering your kitchen and getting on the table and doing in the shoes sitting out in the car ending up in the disc room upstairs Aidan and I had argued at the last moment to do ship songs so there I was annoying the neighbours next door holding the <laughs> phone to myself and then ending with my big um, light up cape um, going out into the garden singing lullaby in the tent with the festoon lights on and then later, uh, so that was that. And I was, uh, and I had great fun. I was doing those kind of like slow animation movies of like, I love Dorothy Wizard of Oz, kind of um, like the shoes and the little figurines. So I had them on the table with flour and then I hoovered that up and they were moving <laughs> around the table. And so I enjoy, I thought if I'm going to do anything, but the only weird thing is when it went out, I had an absolute bad reaction. I felt really vulnerable. I, because usually... Is it because you had done something just because you for fun that you want to yeah I did yeah. but I'm I also realized that I <laughs> I've been you know somebody likened me to a reluctant performer and I think I am I think I I love singing and I love performing but I struggle a little with the aftermath of the reaction not necessarily in gigs but when I'm finished and I think it's a, an, a slight I don't know if it's an Irishness in me to have that embarrassment I know plenty of people at home who don't give a damn and they're like I am amazing and Jesus wasn't I great in that song and I'm like oh my god where's the exit and I'm not <laughs> sure I sang that right so that's just my that's yeah. my default so when the video went out it went out to people and I went but I don't know and I know people were saying stuff and I went turn that thing off I don't want to read what anybody's saying so but then I realised later it was just because I'd been hiding for a while and 
And I really enjoyed watching other people. I got great joy out of watching other performers. And I felt really, I suppose, what I usually feel you're kind of alone on your journey. And it was just lovely on Facebook and thing and willing other people to go, how are you? And what have you, have you been working? Or, you know, not necessarily even talking to them, just seeing their little things go out. Mm -hmm. And... And I suppose that was inspiring too, like seeing um, your one Laura Marling had done a beautiful gig in Union Chapel. And then there was another fellow, uh, James, oh, I'm terrible with the names, I got fog brain, but he did an amazing one in The Globe. And I mean, those were the filmed things, but just anybody who was, you know, trying to reach out. Um, and, and then there was fun things like that mad, like uh, th these are the things that kept me going was the, um, I mean, I bought really stupid things like a, like rabbit heads and like stuff that I could dress up, but like never to be seen. No, but they might turn up on the gig now. But the one I loved was the Zoom of your man over America who was in a court case. There's four people in the picture and the judge and he's a cat and uh, he doesn't know how to turn off his daughter's left this thing on. So it's got a cat head and he says, I, I, I am not a cat. Um, <laughs> and, oh, you know, and they were like, yes, we could see. And that kept me going for months. And then I went online looking for the most closest thing of a cat head, which I did make Ferg aware when we went to New York and he played the piano. Now, he's refusing blankly at the moment, but I'm going to get Does it back on. Does it have on. eye holes? It has eye holes. Oh, it, well, oh, it's, yeah. got, it's got the nose as what you can see through. Like but a it's, mesh. It's so brilliant. And I've actually skied in the thing. I have gone up <laughs> ski. I have filmed myself like at coffee places. I, any chance I can get, <laughs> I, I want to be pictured in that thing. So I'm not sure what that's about, but that's been my aftermath. You were inspired by the court. Yeah. Cat man. Well, since when you went on that dressing thing with me choosing, because you dress so amazingly, I'm going to try some of those in those like outfits. I did. I did a photo shoot recently, and when the cat head came out, the the photographer you could see him go, "This is not what I expected." <laughs> and it was worse still when I left it in his house, and I had to drive like a few weeks later, fifty miles to get the cat head <laughs> on the motorway. Sorry, I've, I've left my cat head. Uh, <laughs> yeah. your, um, something. What, what you were saying about sort of being a reluctant performer. Yeah. You, you mentioned earlier about how you would always do. Sad ones, if you could. There yeah. was something you said, so I came to see the show yeah. last night, and there was yeah. something you said, uh, it was either the second or third song, Yeah. and you said, I'd like to, I'm going to do some Leonard Cohen now to settle myself yeah. in, or calm myself. Now, yeah. I would always do sad songs if I yeah. could. So yeah. my thing, if I'm feeling unsettled, yeah. I'm going to do the most... Uh, obnoxiously silly, crowd pleasing thing. Yeah. What I loved for you there was that you were like, I need to calm myself down yeah. and do something I'm comfortable with. Yeah. Then you did Famous Blue Raincoat. Yeah. Which, in my head, I would have to feel, because I love it and yeah. I would love to sing it, but yeah. I would need to feel my most confident and that the gig is going so well to go, oh, now I can be vulnerable. Yes. But for you, it was... Yeah. to make you feel better was to do that material yeah and I don't know why I don't know why like because I no understand the joyful <laughs> mad stuff to um, uh, maybe it's like it's a bit like the dressing gown was a bit of a we call it in Ireland a sucky blanket which is a comfort blanket I think here and certain songs um are, and, and it's not a song I really know that well I've owned, like yourself I find it quite daunting because it's so well known and it's one I just I always kept away from that and Martha because I was like too well known it's uh, what am I doing going near it so these two last night were some of my favourites in the show because they were watching you do them it 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 felt it, it was it was amazing yeah. it, there was they felt entirely right for you and Martha I wasn't expecting because yeah. you said you were going to do some Tom Waits and I was like oh all the world yeah, is the, do, yeah Exactly, um, and that probably would have happened if I got the chance, because you always want to go back to your babies that you know but, that you can sing. But uh, and for years I kept away. Like I think those songs I might have heard for thirty years, and I'm going like, I love that, but I just don't think I can sing it. And what's it, changed now? Uh, well, I tell. Okay, so this is interesting, right? And so basically, I first of all, the reason maybe it's it's a calm thing is you f you sing to yourself, you sing to the audience, but you're singing to yourself, so you're kind of in your own world, in your whatever you feel like in your shower singing to yourself and um i think what happened was we had a bit of over the lockdown there was a, a very luckily we were getting some kind of weekly help financially from the government but and there and then there had been an offer like for artists to get help for um making records or or releasing 
And it was a bit of a blow because there was probably thousands of people and we didn't get it. And it was it was kind of painful because it was done in a way like what, you know, when you're looking for grants, usually as an artist, you're you're writing like pages and pages and you're spending a month on something. Mm-hmm. Whereas this occasion, like I was talking to Fergal, who was dealing with the, the UK government, where it's like, you need the money, here's the money. Whereas we had to kind of like reach out and mm-hmm. plead for it. So I felt a bit like, I felt, oh my God, it's tough enough. There's a bit of rejection there. So I thought, I'm going to go and record. Aidan had said to me, I'll give you the bloody money if you need it. He said, you've been killing yourself trying to chase all these people. (laughs) And other people who I really admire didn't get it either, who I was more upset about and more shocked about because I watched them over the years, big bands at home, um, and who have made the industry even more like you've done those stadium tours where you've got merchandise and people at the bar and you're mm-hmm. keeping everything going. So I just thought, I rang Fergal and I said, look, I'm losing my mind. I'm, um, I had um, had a few things with my health and I wanted to just take time out. And I, um, we went to this place, which is amazing outside of Dublin, which is a farm. What's quite funny is you probably hear the dog barking in the background, but I said, let us, I said, we never get the chance, you and me, to record. We usually have the band and stuff. So let's just take the songs Mum and Dad loved or My Sister Love. Let's make an album for them. Let's take my best friend's ones. Let's take the ones I've always loved, but I've been too scared to do. Let's take the ones you like. Let's do the ones like Eminem. And he's looking at me going, she's losing it. <laughs> and so um, he said, we need a plan. We need a plan, Camille, you're mental. And then, <laughs> so basically... Um, we the poor fella I think we did a hundred songs in six days like and then I did one with a guitarist like with him and a guitarist and we only got through six songs in like five days he says now do you know Camille how you know he's a modest guy he doesn't think he says that he's good at piano he never thinks that but I realised oh my god I've been putting him through the hoops (laughs) but what was brilliant too is because he has a shyness he doesn't like kind of being showy and stuff and I'd be like I was like sometimes sitting we'd record and I'd be listening to him going I can't believe I'm capturing Fergal I'm capturing some of the most beautiful playing I've ever heard and it was very great for our friendship and very great for us musically because we do um, have almost a married life on the road where we drive each other nuts because we're so close and you know people see us shouting at each other going Jesus they're going to make through it then we're like (laughs) hey that was great and they're like this is mental and so we what was nice it took away any artifice of you need to prove yourself because the recordings weren't going anywhere they could go somewhere we weren't Mm -hmm. sure but the idea was it was me and Fergal me behind a little baton thing with my 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 sweets and my uh, you know my gummy stuff and him with you know like his hot chocolate or whatever and us and then later into the night a bit of wine and we and and this guy who's amazing Dave was on the uh, who just pressed the button and hearing the dog coming up every now and again and it just felt really kind of like wow we're just going to do as much recording and so the, that's where those songs came from. And what happened was we said to each other, we'll only give each other two takes and no more, because what happens is you'll argue about the third take. It's always the first or second one anyway. And if it doesn't work out, it meant you weren't supposed to sing it. And we were taking like even Harry Styles, like Harry Styles, Taylor Swift, you name it. Like, I mean, I mean, the Kanye West stuff, like is still a bit never to be heard. Um, like, but I do want to approach it at some stage. So that Martha turned up on that and Leonard. And then I went home and, and what was nice, what we did was we would have rehearsed the key, but we didn't rehearse how it would sing it. And so we said, we have to just feel it as we go. Mm-hmm. And so then you'd suddenly sing it and you go, oh, my God, like that's so like you understood the song in a way you never, you know, yourself when you're trying to work through something your whole life. Like and you say it about having a child like that is kind of, oh, my God, I'm there in time and all the rest. You don't give your time to be in the moment. So telling each other two songs was being in the moment and that was amazing because like we were nailing songs that we can never nail when we rehearse but we had to because time is money Mm -hmm. I'm paying them I'm not making any and I've got Fergal down so there's loads of songs there some that may never see the light of day I mean I have this amazing picture of my mum that I've always wanted to use because you know each year you get somebody going your promoter get a new picture Camille and you're like are you kidding me you've been holding (laughs) on to the old propagandist ones for about 15 years to get the audience (laughs) in and so uh, there's that like I have I go all oh, right that well that could be that kind of Dylan one and this one could be the one my mom and dad love the you know was trying to sing it some of their songs so that's the long answer but it was like it was a real big awakening because after like how many years of singing I was like that was a total different way to kind of put you under the thing of we like we'd have to very quickly I 
like either stop a song go oh that I, I think I'm doing it too fast or thing and mm. then into it and then not talk to each other anymore because you can be your worst person uh, myself personally as stopping something um, not kind of uh, realizing this this song is going it sounds so stupid it's only a song but it's like um, uh, you can stop going oh the tempo isn't right or the key you know and what you're doing is you're scared because you think you can't sing it properly so that's my you know thing so those songs I suppose they're like uh, you know if you're looking at the great song books of Ella Fitzgerald they're like the great song books for us mm -hmm. those songs you, we know them so well so I kept away from them for so long because of that but you know because the, the way you were recording it, it that almost feels like almost like a pub lock-in yeah is, 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 and there's no pressure because you're like well if, if it doesn't work people don't need to hear yeah. it yeah. so I think that that kind of gives it more of a a rawness and a humanity because you're just go, you're going to do you're not trying to necessarily prove. too hard. You're, yeah. you're just like, I'm going to do this because I love this song. Yeah. And that can and you make don't, the and most yeah. beautiful recording. Yeah, absolutely. And you don't prove... Like, it's a funny one we have. Like, as you said with the band before, saying I do things more like an architect. I mean, I, um, I would say sometimes, like, I've worked with some really incredible, brilliant musicians and I feel terrible for what I've done to them because I'm like, play it wrong. Play it like you don't know it. Play it like you don't have a clue what's going on. They're like, eh, I'm a good... And, and sometimes I say, play it like you're in your bedroom for the first time you ever played it and you're just working it out. And that's kind of where I want to get a song because there is a moment when you play it, when you're too um, good at... I know the song works or it's I always think that it's good to have a channel of kind of vulnerability, whether that's madness or uh, anger or happiness or being sad that you have that channel open. Um, so mistakes can happen and that's OK. And like even last like like because poor Charlotte, who's brilliant, would only practice like for, you know, those moments she was coming in. Then I was like, oh, that's a solo. I didn't know it was going to happen. So all those <laughs> things, you know, add to it, it being kind of feeling real. And I think, you know, as you say, I think the thing is, it, I, I, th I think what was nice is I've heard recordings we did at the start. Oh, my God. And we're, I'm so formal and am I singing well? And there's like in these shoes, it's just too neat and tidy. And as time went on, like we try and capture shows, live recordings, because that's where oh, like a lot of mm -hmm. people say. Well, magic happens there. Do you know what I mean? There but on, you know. on, the, on the subject of in these shoes, yeah. you were saying too neat and tidy. I, yeah. I saw an interview where you said that when you did Jules Holland. Yeah. You changed. <laughs> you said you said like we right. We need to change this yeah. for TV. So you, it, yeah. it was it was something to do with the drum. Yeah, wasn't it? Yeah. So um, the band wanted to kill me. So I I'll do that during like you know yourself during a, a few years. Like say for example, before I explain any of the shoes, there was like songs like Marie in Amsterdam, which are kind of some favorite songs of mine. And um, I found after a while, I just wasn't getting, like I'd be telling the band to slow down or fast up or, and it was getting my way. And then I thought, I'm really sorry, but like, they're amazing. It's not their fault that I have these voices in my head. I was like saying, I need to clear all the music now so I can sing it. It, I, it got to that stage. And now I can't bring that band back in. It's, it, you know, I might actually, with Marique's uh, compliment is so beautiful. I might go back there. But the thing within these shoes was, it was becoming like when we did weddings, it was becoming too... I couldn't tell the form of it. It was just becoming a bit too normal for my liking. That drives me nuts as a singer because I'm always saying, you sound too Dixie, you sound too jazzy. I want you to sound a bit, you know, mad. Or if we're going to do this, we've got to own it. And, and it's probably the love of hearing the likes of Tom Waits' world where it is like... It's... To do things wrong isn't easy. You got to do it wrong so it doesn't sound like it's absolutely, you know, wrong <laughs> and falling. Like Jesus, how did I pay money to see this person? But what happened within these shoes? I just we worked this amazing guy, Aina Hickey, who's a lawyer, who's one of the best musicians I ever um, met. Now he's really like a Tom Waits figure himself. He like makes things out of like an Irish hurley, which is like a stick. It's like a lacrosse stick and plays with dustbins. And sometimes somebody said this on the Royal Festival. They said, we just saw this guy walk out the back with a ladder, closing it, opening and closing it. Going. I said, yeah, that would have been Aina. He would have found the ladder and would have right, played it as an instrument. Yeah. And you're not even thinking twice about it. And um, so w with him, um, it was... 
it was the night before. It was the night before Christmas, ladies and gentlemen. And Fergal and Paul Byrne were in my sister's place. And they're like, you are kidding me. You were going to go on live tea tomorrow. And you have decided to use a dustbin instead of drums <laughs> and change the rhythm of the piece and how it opens. And and I said, yeah. And we ne- And the thing is, it was brilliant. And we never did it again. We never played it like that again. We never did it like that again. And it's... And we need to record it because it's still my favourite way. But it was just in my mad mind, because I had a kind of a heart attack once I realised we were doing it. I was saying, we have to make it different. We're going on that TV. Now, I remember, um, I remember, you might see it in the clip, that he had this thing which had a kind of like... Hello. Oh, yes. Hello? Okay. Slight technical issue there. We are back. Yeah. You were saying so it was the night before Christmas. Night before Christmas. So basically... Um, we'd asked, been asked to do two songs for the Jules Holland and I think looking back on it it was like they kept on saying you, we thought you were so crazy and they were not furious but I think they were like what are you doing to us going on live TV doing it in a way we've never done before maybe part of it was like I thought wow we've been invited on the show I'm such a fan of we've got to make this be really unusual and uh, and more interesting especially because I was such a Kirsten McCall fan I didn't want to crumb across you know it's okay in gigs to kind of mess around with something but anyway so the dust but what was great was when the dustbin arrived and the technical person went how am I supposed to um, put the sound to this like you know oh, he was probably just thinking why are they bringing a dustbin into the studio and uh, trying to, to mic it and Aina anyway he played that but on uh, well, like uh, the thing that so my big pride in that moment and I cannot find my shoes that I bought for that it was Brighton actually uh, <laughs> that I bought those shoes um, and I loved them so much and I got knickers to fi- to to match them but to me it was a very kind of like innocent oh my my pants match my you know every day I was going to how sexy I'm going it's really cool isn't it <laughs> so Aiden goes it's a bit full on you know the way you danced and that and I said really and it just kind of going for it but I think it was you know for the lads not to feel that they were too um, you know, uh, playing it normally. But I I do think it was, a, you know yourself, there's a moment in time, and if anybody who does live performance, it's terrifying, five, four, three, and you're going, oh, you know, how many people are watching? You've got Tom Jones in the corner. You're more terrified about him. <laughs> Some people from the Snow Patrol. You're like, I think I was more terrified of them watching me than I was the, that it was on TV. Was what was the the moment actually? Because yep. I mean, I'm I'm curious whether it's this because I think that's where I first saw you yep. was Jules Holland. Um, it was either that or the Ship Song on yep. YouTube. Uh, one of those two. Yep. Don't remember which way around. Yep. What was that like a big uh, launch moment for you, or had you already had? like a, a big career boost, and then that came from that. Or? I don't know. I would definitely think that year, like. Um, Funnily enough, the YouTube um, clip you're mentioning, which is in my house, was filmed a week before uh, we a slot came free. And I think it was 10 days before Jules Holland. And the day I filmed um, YouTube of Ship Song, I don't know if it was before I filmed it or after we got the call. So it was on that day of that special video to me. And isn't isn't it it? that you're like, you know, do you you feel in some way maybe I mean, maybe I'm, you know, uh, I don't know what I'm talking about. Anyway. Serendipity. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's that, that you opened yourself up to do this thing, that then an opportunity Sometimes to sort of found I, its Sometimes, I'd way like to think that. I'd like to think, I mean, um, the funny thing, and I meant to say something, and I, uh, sorry, uh, what I meant to say about that thing about trying to get musicians to do different things, um, I know this is going back in our conversation probably about eight minutes ago, but when I used to say to Fergal, why can't they do things differently? Why is it me that I can't explain? He said, just because you're a musician doesn't mean you're musical, Camille. And I was like, it was the biggest light bulb moment in years going, so if you play an instrument, that doesn't mean you're musical. He said, yeah, you can play well. That doesn't mean you musically want to be adventurous or try things. So there was that thing. And then the thing about serendipity is I do, I'd like to think good people, good things happen to good people um, or people who try now, before I had switched my career as an architect, I was too scared to go on stage because I thought, I'm not trained, I'm older, you know, the whole thing. I was like, oh, Jesus. And then I saw people on stage and I went, they're just doing it. I said, it's not just look. 
you've got luck but you've got to do it so what you're saying is right I what that made me realize because you know I think some people think I used to think people will find you if you're good but then I realized you actually got to put yourself out yeah. there for them to find you so the work has to be done in the sense yes things can happen but you just got to take the risk even if you're terrified so like say for example um you're saying about when was this a big moment there's several times probably of like pinch me moments where I was so delighted one of them would have been playing England for the first time that would have been a massive massive kind of psychological thing for an Irish person to have traveled across the water to you know like England and um, you know or Great Britain and America those two places you think oh my god playing there and so your first place is in a tiny Spiegel tent, you know, at the tiniest one I'd ever played with a little mini going up a wall in some kind <laughs> of like, I don't know, it was a, a car factory. And then and then the, the the middle bit was too high. So I looked like Toulouse Lautrec singing on the other <laughs> side, my Brel songs. And we all slept in the same bed that night. And we were so excited traveling down in our little car to our venue and then playing Brighton. And that magical thing of like, having written to the famous Spiegel tent and him then saying, come to Edinburgh, come and perform there and come and do Le Clique, which ended up being like this amazing variety show to be, I was kind of the most normal, as my mother says, you were not the head in the line, Camille. You were the most normal person singing in it while people doing all these amazing acts around you. So that was like a really incredible moment. And I think this, that was 2008 was um, uh, Jules. And I do think between 2008 and kind of 10 was kind of, I see this big moment um, and you never know when these moments are coming because you're in performing you're up and then you're going to be down and then you're going to be up and you're and then I realized that was pretty massive and I knew it at the time I was like I don't know if this will ever happen again and whenever I feel down about stuff I have to remind myself remember you did that so you know I know that's so stupid but performers need to sometimes have little things they remind themselves of um to go that was magical that real, I did, and, I did and sh- yeah and ship song there was a moment in time <laughs> where I think I was probably finding my feet a little and Morag who worked with me in uh, Edinburgh she was great she was like a Rothweiler she'd be contact people she was in touch with the people from Jules and it was just very lucky that she was the kind of person who everybody got on with and uh, Mark who was running the program had an interest and then we ended up touring with Jules which was kind of magical I remember being the Royal Albert Hall you know, we had like a 27 minute thing and I was counting the minutes how long we had on and um, like I thought don't fall off the stage and then I was leaving it and somebody said who the hell are you? You never told us your name. I was so excited <laughs> to do the thing. I was like, I'm never going to get across this business because I didn't even know how to sell myself. But th- th- there was a time like where we played like in Edinburgh when you were like selling out like the 900 seaters. Um, and all, like it was also my promoter, um, you know, the, it, well, funnily enough, my promoters have always been comedy promoters. Mm-hmm. Um, so... You know, well, they know the Fringe Festival. They know the Fringe Festival. And I was very lucky. Like, your man came, like, I loved Ed so much. And he came for years and saying, and I was, I just didn't really understand the whole thing. I thought, I don't, you know, what am I going to? And then people later said, these guys are really incredible. And he was wonderful. Like, we went into tours and it was, I suppose the thing, and, and what was amazing too was that I think a year later, um, then we were doing, like, the run at the Apollo but there was a or the, the roundhouse like things that you always went like you had little things going tick Sydney Opera House the roundhouse the Royal Festival Hall and you do go I cannot believe I suppose where, where me and Fergal came from when we first started gigging is he'd say you choose the place and I'll we'll work at the songs and nothing much has changed from that moment now what has changed is sometimes you're up and sometimes you're down so that's what you just gotta uh, to stay in this business long enough uh, somebody said to ride those waves yeah and Phil Coulter who is you know he's big kind of lots of people love him all over the world he is a great kind of like um, uh, person at home in Ireland uh, and Fergal had worked with him he says if you can stay in the business that long you're doing something so Mm -hmm. you know sometimes when you're like at home going I have no clue and the cat's going just get out of the house take your CDs (laughs) from under the bed and you know uh, you know it's um, uh, like there's definitely been uh, you know things like you know doing Mrs. Henderson with you know Judy Dench or Will Young and um, you, you, you know all a, those things which, pinch me moments, but, uh, I think. which yeah. and I do always know at the time I always go this will never happen again Camille <laughs> you know and, and like the only thing is I always said I, I try and lose 
I, I wait for that film, but I kept on eating chocolate. I was so happy. I thought I mustn't be into this business that much that I'm not bothered <laughs> trying to slim myself down for this role. But it was, and he was amazing. And he came. Stephen Bruce came to see us, you know, in shows later. And Will was so sweet, and he came and even lent us the flat months to stay in. Like just, you know. Um, yeah, unbelievable stuff, like, you know. Well, you've also done a Meltdown Festival. So was it Yoko Ono yeah. this year? So did, did does, does, <laughs> the, does the phone go and they're like, hello, this is Yoko Ono? Um, no, well, not with her. It did with Stephen Fear. <coughs> it was like, hello, I I hear you're quite, you know, dark. Uh, you have a bit of fun in you. And I'm like, who the hell's trying to pretend? <laughs> you know, it's like me always putting on my mother's accent and then people saying to her, Camille, stop it, please. When I should say, it's me, it's me. But um, no, I got the call actually Jane who we bumped into Jane Beast who's an amazing um, lady who used to run the meltdown um, I had just had Lila three weeks before I got the call and I was quite like oh my god I didn't know what was going on anyway they said Yoko and I'd like you to sing a meltdown and I think I'd done it once before not, oh no it was a political evening with Richard Th- Richard Thompson that, but you know done those evenings where you appeared with people and I was like and people were like you just had a baby and I went I can't say no to yoga oh no for god's <laughs> yeah, sakes yeah, just... I don't care how I am or what I look like but it was hilarious it was a very weird thing when I was pregnant with Lila we had done two things just after the pregnancy and just not that I felt infallible but I'm a nervous wreck before gigs usually and it was just because I was pregnant I didn't really care for things because I just thought this is more important like I mean there was a thing of like doing the Shakespeare thing it was a bit mad trying to roll around and hide my bump because people are like oh she's put a bit of weight on and I'm like <laughs> trying to, trying to, I didn't really tell people about it not even my street knew they were like you've had a baby because I had big capes you know <laughs> and then the baby didn't have a name for three months so they're like you sure it's your baby and I was like it's Did Tiny O'Sullivan baby? <laughs> yeah baby well Jane called it Tiny O'Sullivan which I loved but anyway that was magical I went over and it was so bonkers because I went up on stage and Earl Slick was there who's the amazing guitarist who worked with John Lennon and David Bowie he is extraordinary and then there was Sean Lennon and then there was a whole group of other musicians who I knew from previous gigs um, touring, who were uh, wonderful and I had these kind of gold shoes on and the cape and something else and red tights and Sean was like I like I know you're laughing at me now because the state of me but Sean was like I love your style you must be my stylist and I was staring at him going Sean Lennon wants me to be his stylist (laughs) and then Earl Slick said you're the craziest thing we've had on stage today it's fantastic he said we may need more madness and I said no worries Earl I can be as crazy as you want so what was brilliant later was um Sean and I I mean there was like Boy George and Patty Smith the embarrassment was that I'd been on the lift the door was closing and I saw Patty like Patty is amazing but she's also got that look like oh my god I hope I haven't upset Patty <laughs> as the doors are closing and I'm trying to get the you're thing open for the, like, press the and I'm so button. sorry like this and anyway later on myself and uh, and Sean saying come and have a whiskey in the cupboard I'm trying to hide from my mom so she doesn't see and then I and say saying, I'm hiding from Patty Smith nobody yeah, exactly <laughs> And then Sean going, my mum loved your singing. And you're just going, this is mental. And it was a pinch me moment because I'm a massive Beatles fan. I'm a massive, you know, Paul McCartney, John Lennon. And, you know, Yoko was incredible that night. I mean, anybody, like she was on the stage. She owned it. Uh, Susie Sue, you know, Lennon Lovage. You know, you're just staring at people who you're in such... And you you are kind of going, what the... Like, I, I, Fergal and I are always like, how do these little people, little people from Ireland, you know, not that you think of yourself as leprechauns, but we suddenly, you're like, <laughs> doing the RSSC, just like, what the hell's going on? And you, so you have a kind of, uh, you know... I always, like Fergal was joking last night, he said, you'll be like a horse out of the... Um, what is out of the stalls? And I always feel like that as a performer. Like, people say especially for this Yoko Ono one, like, because I was, I felt like I was going to be like a rocket that would take off. I'm so nervous sometimes, like, it's been likened, they saw me in a gig, like in Kinsale, where it was kind of in a ruined castle, and a guy said, you were like a mouse, just threatening back and forth, and then you came out like a big lion. I didn't know who the hell it was, and I said, yeah, I have to be a big lion, because they're terrifying me, and they're a lion too. So it was such a, um, you know, 
an amazing thing and like there's moments like that or like say you end up like I toured you know with the Pogues for their uh, rum and sodomy um, uh, kind of the, the 25 years of that album and um, you're staring from the stage like you're crying backstage I mean I adore Shane he's got a childlike thing to him I don't think a lot of people usually see in his little kind of like <laughs> his laugh and um you see him singing some of the songs you've loved all your life and then you end up singing some of them like well, you, uh, you know Kirsty like you know yeah. and, and like we got the call like London O2 and I remember at the time Jem Finer who wrote the song with Shane because I never realised um, I think it was Jem who wrote the the jig part and Shane who wrote the slow ballad part and then the producer had to put the two together so I never knew why the magic of that song was both were written from two different two people. people and then joined uh, for and those, those who don't know yeah, sorry, Camille does uh, <laughs> does uh, uh, the sadly no longer with us Kirsty McCall's yeah. part in Fairy Tale of New York with the Pogues yeah and uh, to be honest nobody can ever own it like I'm such a fan of her it is hers and all you can do is try and sing it well give it the because it is a thing you know some songs you, you just go like I mean In These Shoes is a tribute to her it it she was around when I started <laughs> singing it and um, the fairy tale you've just got to smile and pay honor and that's what you're doing and uh, and make Shane not uh, like the first time I ever got asked to do that I, I think it was like when I was still just finishing architecture or something and I was eating a mince pie when I got the call and I was like oh my god and then I went oh my god I only know the chorus nobody ever knows the verses <laughs> so, so I'm cycling on a bike and and trying to learn somebody's printed it for me and I'm trying to learn it on the way down and it was the Olympia and then Shane was like, yeah, she's pretty mental. I'll go on tour with her again. And what was funny about the London 02 one was Jem Fine's daughter, because he sometimes used to get his lovely, um, Shane used to get his beautiful mother to do it, or Jem used to get his gorgeous daughter. And she said, oh, well, she's pregnant, so we're n she's not going to do it. And I went... I'm pregnant, but I'm not going to tell them because I want to do it. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I had this. Escape yeah, on. yeah. So you know, you told me about you, we were talking about a Vivian Westwood. That was the dress that I got. Like it was a sparkly one. Now, it kind of covered it, but I had to. I must have been about five or six months. Like I thought, I must be very careful with this dress and the baby. Um, but Shane was throwing me around, and I had like I had to keep my shoes. Pla I thought you know <laughs> planted, but the snow was coming down, and. How it did that feel? it was in unbelievable, you know, and I, you know, the band was so kind, and their their manager Mark is just, he's one of the nicest guys I've ever met. They really took care of me, and um, I think they know you're terrified, so they just you get all the smiles. Like it's anarchy with those guys; you don't yeah. know if they're gonna you're, you're hug the, you or kill you. In the, you know, in the yeah. <laughs> and but they were kind about that, and um, and then later on, what was wonderful was Victoria, who's married to Shane now, who's a good friend. They had the, the, which I love these kind of fantasy things. There was the Narnia wardrobe in the London O2. She said, "Come and look at this," and you opened it, and it was a bar behind. And ever since then, we're doing our house up, and I went, "I want Narnia." I bought three white. Christmas trees recently an agent says I don't know we need more than that like the notion of our <laughs> tiny like room trying to create a Narnia oh, you know he said we could do it well I love those things now he did that himself and he was like he loves doing that stuff I love like we're doing our house up and I mean the joke is there's two bedrooms and three bars like you know we're more interested <laughs> we need a bar downstairs and a bar behind the door and friends are going what about your bedrooms Camille and we need ah, Narnia well. and we have a swing in the living room but I did say to him we need to move the swing back because you know and had the railings higher in case people are drinking he said you always talk about people drinking and maybe falling over the railings or the swing and, and th then we realised we both talk like because we know all our friends are quite mad but also because you've got three bars in your house well of exactly course, well, people and I wanted doing? Aiden is a bit of a nerd he likes train sets so I said we could have a tiny train set that just brings a gin and tonic from one room <laughs> to the other and I'm doing a, a um, design but come, you know with the joy of it having been an architect uh, you know, Fergal saying, oh, you must be having good fun designing that. It's for Lila's room. I've got like one of, she's got this big wardrobe, but I've got two little doors. One that's for the cat, which looks like a Tom and Jerry <laughs> little door. And then a big one for my daughter. And like friends are going, do you really think? I said, it has to be done. There has to be a Tom and Jerry door in this house. This sounds absolutely, you, you live in Dublin, don't you? Yeah, I'm still in Dublin. So we're doing up a house. I mean, I did get stopped. I did want a, a slide to get us from 
the ground floor to the basement into one of the bars because I said it'd be an easy access if you had me <laughs> tracking. <laughs> you just slide down. How do you get back up? But for, yeah, well, the, through the steps, but Aidan said no but I still I was looking at plastic ones recently <laughs> online <laughs> or like you know the metal ones you see where they curl and I thought uh-huh. well maybe you know later on <laughs> the architect is very helpful for these things it is it? well I'm not of the real world I, I, I realised I don't do reality well I like fantasy far too much and that's probably why I was destined to be a performer but I mean I did work as an architect and I did all the stuff and all the you know but my head was like I've always been a kind of a dreamer for design so it's nice that and I suppose shows do that too like yeah. that you can I say no you know, one can say no to you because you know how to make this all happen as well well I don't know but the only stupid thing because I'm all best friends all my best friends are still the girls from architecture and um, which is nice because you know uh, I don't kind of probably hang out in the theatre world that much but what I didn't realise they said this is how much it will cost and I was like but if I just put on this boiler suit I can paint it. And, <laughs> and they were like, Camille, it's this per square metre. And like, I don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> so that's where it doesn't, that's don't where it's dash not my good. Dream. Yeah. And then going, oh my God, I'm going, like trying to work out how many CDs I've got to sell yeah. for the rest of my life. Well, you know, <laughs> the CDs flew out last well, night. Well, so we're trying, love. You it's sold different your last now. DVD it's as well. Tri- well, that was it. That's you to got, me. <laughs> but I, I'll give you the other one, which is the, uh, li- and I only brought the, I only brought the one over. So I thought. And it's got, it has got lovely teeth marks in it from a cat though which I quite like but I've got two cats so. that would be my sister's cat because you see I go and visit my sister is older she loves me but I always try and spend my time because she doesn't like me leaving my stuff there but I always there's a thing under the stairs I designed and I, and I think <laughs> <laughs> well I didn't do this on purpose but I always try and hide whatever leftover CDs I have going I did it really well and she'll find it within an hour you know because oh. I said to my dad don't clean that room Vicky won't find me she said she told me she found it an hour after you left so <laughs> That's probably her cat who, who bit into it because um, her cat needs to be is quite old and bites things. So she's like on Valium. So I'm like, <laughs> so I should take her. Yeah, not Valium. You know what I mean, well, ladies I, well, and I, I think it gives it a lovely touch. Good. Sorry about that. Um, oh my God. No, I think it's good. I looked at it and I was like, yeah, it's good, lovely. As long as it's not Camille's teeth marks. Uh, well, they're very tiny. I don't okay. know. You, you seem to have perfectly normal adult Formed. sized teeth. Uh, what I was going to say is that from you, you were talking about all these opportunities, yeah. uh, opportunities that yeah. came. It seems a lot that people sort of find you and go, I think you would be wonderful for this. Um, one I would like to talk yeah. about is Rain Dogs Revisited. Okay, yeah, oh Which God, was yeah. the 25th anniversary of Tom Waits' yeah. Rain Dogs. And uh, the lineup is sort of a bit of a, a, bit of a dream one for Unbelievable. me. Unbelievable. Just, you know, yeah. y- yourself, the Tiger Lilies, St. Vincent, and that barely touches the surface. No, unbelievable. I mean, you'd there. be... And that was probably... I mean, I have been such a fan of the Tiger Lilies and I hadn't I had known of St. Vincent because this is before she went stratospheric. So this was just she was doing really well. Um, And uh, oh, my God, uh, um, Erica Stuckey. And and there was loads of different amazing people on it. And those things are kind of amazing because they're kind of terrifying because you've got to know you've got to. do justice to work to the work and also you've got this level of what you're coming up against and there was even Jane Birkin I think on the last part like who was so lovely on the last date we did in Holland or something um, yeah I felt really lucky doing those that was to, that was um, a kind of a beginning that happened in the Barbican that we'd done a Brell evening and with these amazing people um, Diamanda Gallas like we were joking because we couldn't get the hair dryer off her Ma- Mark Alden <laughs> and myself were dying to get the you know the makeup and hair dryer and like they were with Diamanda going come on you've got to sort us Mark Almond I'm such a fan he like we were both he was like me backstage wandering around and of course goes off and just makes it amazing and so from that gig sorry this is my tangential towing, talking we got another uh, this amazing guy um, uh, Mark Cardinal from uh, Rain Dogs Limited that's what he called the company put us on in these shows in Lyon which was in an old amphitheatre outside and we were doing first of all a kind of a Let It Be and The Beatles then we did Rain Dogs and then we did um, In Dreams and then something else which I can't remember so we did four kind of shows together where we toured what I didn't know at the end of those shows was if the audience liked you they took their little (coughs) 
um, cushions and threw them at you on stage. I was like, Jesus, <laughs> they were coming from every every direction, so and it was just thrown at you. it was joyous. And there were some kind of like rock stars from France who were doing um, what is it when they crowd they go on the sur- they crowd surf and stuff. So that was a magical moment, and we did the first Rain Dog show there, and then toured around, brought it the Barbican, and um, it just was. You know, like, because you're always, you're trying to do your own shows. And so every year, Edinburgh kind of allows you to kind of create something new. And then you're always, you know, throwing back in some of the best numbers. So to do those things with other people, um, just, uh, you know, it's, it's, I mean, it's not saying it's a busman's holiday. It's like, you know, heaven. You just can't believe it because you're there beside them, watching them on stage, and then you might end up singing a song with them. Mm-hmm. And just have fun kind of meeting other people who... Like, I just remember, I don't know if it was um, your man who I love so much, Richard Hawley, like, brushing my hair. Like, to, like I was going, this is bonkers stuff. And that just happy, happy memories. Lot, like well, I, remember taking, on, yeah. I remember taking a walk with St. Vincent, and she dresses so beautifully. She had this big black kind of hat on with these big black kind of um, glasses and she had flat little kind of shoes and I was just walking beside her just kind of wasn't stalking her I was just looking <laughs> at her just going she looks amazing you know and uh, she was lovely how she talked and, and just finding out these people and then investigating their music um, yeah I've missed doing that because that hasn't the last time probably would have been three or four years ago we, like we ended up doing similar things in Australia for Jeff Buckley's music and um, uh, and what was funny I was doing shows in um, Australia and then In Dreams was over there so they said you want to do Sydney Opera House you want to do Melbourne and you got like an afternoon's rehearsal you're like oh my god um, but people, uh, everywhere you go people seem to just pick you up and, well, no, and well, well I'm not sure about I'm, I, do you know what's funny it happens I, look, I feel very lucky it doesn't happen so much home because I think I tour more abroad but it's always harder they say for wherever you're from Mm -hmm. but I think you're kind of an interesting little Irish figure when you're you know and I don't always think it happens like maybe talking to here you 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 give your best Hollywood face like your Facebook Hollywood face sort of like well and then I met this person and then they put me in the Jeff Buckley one (laughs) we we, yes we also did this one oh I've had loads of (laughs) listen I've had some terrible like I'm sure like I know the night I did it in the Barbican I felt awful because I hadn't done I felt I had messed up my songs and I remember sitting in the in the park for like crying my eyes out for art like but that can happen it probably was induced by loads of drink and feeling <laughs> vulnerable and I was in front of my mum and my sister and they're like that top's a bit short on you and so you go through wonderful moments but you can go through the like you can mm-hmm. do the great gigs but sometimes you know and I know other people on that show felt vulnerable too and there was moments I was holding hands with other people so even at the best ho- moments and of your career where you're asked to do things they can be brilliant but they can also be where you find yourself in the middle of some t- small town going Jesus I messed it up because as you know you're only as good as your last gig mm-hmm. so there has been such highlights and I think I have been lucky because I am the worst girl at doing auditions so I've been very lucky that some people have spotted well, they, what you do seek, on stage they you know. you out as uh, Luckily, because if I would, there's no way I would get any additions I do is they're awful. <laughs> but I talk to my partner, he's the same. Like he says, he gets up and think because I get too scared. Like, and then I'm like trying to apologize for it. And that's even worse. It's like digging a hole. <laughs> they're like, all right, Camille, we'll send you. Yeah, you we'll you, be in touch. You, you've mentioned before that's the, the court girl coming out. It is the, the court the girl. You said yeah. this last night as well. Oh, it's so bad. It's, 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 it's a, and I said to Fergal, I said once, I said, it's an age thing. And he went, uh, I'm your age and it's not, I don't do it. And I was going, shit, like, Jesus. And so, it is a thing and it, it's so funny because uh, a few girls say it and we just like sorry 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 and um, but you find with certain people in arm when they do that they just explode after a while that i'm not fucking sorry <laughs> after like two years you know uh, two years of apologizing <laughs> yeah. it builds up yeah, and up and up basically um uh, what we're saying about that that in these stories it seems to be that people find you and then put you in these these projects yeah. or producers put on your show and obviously you yeah. create the show and stuff yeah. but so Changeling yeah. you self produced this didn't that you? that was mental yeah you, you paid for it yeah, all, it, of, all of it that it was too much money and I can't even go there because I think I'd it was so much money and the reason why it was a disaster 
I mean, the album's yep. amazing. Oh, that's lovely to hear. That's so nice to hear because you know you sit at home looking, oh, that's a nice cover. And the whole thing was very funny because we, we, um, I hadn't, I always thought, oh, I want to really record a good album, but I did it the wrong way. I didn't know how to get a producer, so I, I, I spent money on these sessions, and then I'd spend money on those sessions, and then I, then I, when we did decide, um, some of the songs, like say "True Love Waits," we, when we, when there was a lovely guy, Brian. He used to end up being a band, Bellex One. He just sat down with an auto harp and did it. And we never captured the beauty of that. So that initial recording, which wasn't done to track, had to go on the album. And I had to sing, I think I had to sing over it or some. It was something mm. mad that you can never, we don't have to track things to it. Now, the the album cover itself was hilarious too. Sean and Yvette had this place. And then I, I just grabbed the, the rabbit that was on stage and the wig because my hair looked like shit and I went and to, and they were like you really want to do this with the rabbit I said I just really like this rabbit mm-hmm. and it was perfect and now nobody knows why it's there it's this lovely red cape and, and I love it although I did do a gig in Germany like 12 years later he says uh you don't really look like, I mean, look at the state of you. You don't look like a picture. <laughs> and you're like, thank you. That's exactly, even my promoter used to say, they, I'm like, they're too direct. And I didn't know what to say. But the, the songs, what was great was Aina and Fergal kind of took over, the three of us took over producing duties. But we just spent so long using different people. We just did it the wrong way. So, mm. I, I mean, it's not like a tiny house, but you know what I mean? It was expensive. And I didn't really get... Like, you know, that's why I haven't done it. I'm trying to do something now. And maybe what a bit of that was the house, because that's why live gigs are great to record. Because mm-hmm. the cave one, I was, uh, you know yourself, you're trying, you, you go in, you're going, I hope, Yeah. I, sometimes, you, like say we've done Wilton's, I'll record three nights because you go out of the, some, you're going mm-hmm. to be able to stitch it together. And also, sometimes don't tell the band you're doing it because you do tell some because you know they'll play more but mm-hmm. it's really, it's one of these ethereal, it's one of these moments that's either going to happen or not. Mm-hmm. And we've just been lucky that more so than often, like when we did the Brell or the Cave or Live at the Olympia, those nights were great because there's been some along the way and you go, oh, God damn it. Like, you know, I wish that it would have been the one, but it wasn't. Uh, and we had a lovely one recently, uh, you know, we, when we were scared going back to perform and we did gigs in a church in um, Pepper Canister in Dublin um, I thought oh, I have to record it it's such a beautiful venue I had all this dream of like getting one of those drones and you just captures you walking up to the church we haven't done that yet but I still got that in mind but um, it went great and it was such a nice moment when you know like as you're getting to the end of the gig you captured you're like mm-hmm. I hope to God they pressed record mm-hmm. and the band were hugging each other and you know so we knew you told them yeah. that night <laughs> but uh, yeah I told them you know that time but uh, sorry I don't even know what you asked me in that regard but that uh, oh, I was just saying that, that, you know, that it's so nice to hear it that you made uh, that wasn't someone going hello we'd like you to do this yeah. here we'll pay for this you got yeah. it it was something that that, that uh, it's clearly a, a, a passion project. My one of my favorites from it is "Wake Up." Uh, oh well, that's Arcade great. Fire. Um, I just I, I I've listened to that album from beginning to end so many times. That's so that, nice to hear. That and the live at the Olympia one. Oh, that's the, so nice. I mean, and the K one recently yeah. was a fairly new edition, but yeah. the the changeling one, I just. Um, it has something really. And also, you, yeah. you, you seem to think it was a flop. You know, it's got over, I think, two million streams Jeez, on. I don't ever. On uh, See, I don't one particular any... streaming platform. Yeah, one of those ones. Um, <laughs> no, I think it's. So I think it's True Love Waits. That's uh, amazing. It's got over two million. That's streams. no. That, you know, but it's because I don't. Um, I'm terrible. I I I do my own kind of like mailing list and the social media and stuff. But I ne- I, do, I people probably don't ever bother to join because I don't check. I'm too nervous to check replies. I'm, I think it's years of having people who've written stuff to you like, uh, you know, look at the stage of you and that, or and oh, you get loads I, of lovely I've done things. But you know what I mean? I know oh fine my well. <laughs> God, it's cruel. So, I. I, I kind of just glaze over stuff, try and check stuff and cover my hands over things. So it is always a, an absolute pleasure when you hear it from people. Or even like, say, last night when people like somebody said Dark Room and Wine. I went, oh, my God, they like Dark Room and Wine because it wasn't one we did in sets. So you are you record for yourself and you hope that it has, you know. And what is nice is like, you know, that one at True Love Waits. I think there was something Fergal had passed on to me that 
it, it got a mention in kind of Radiohead covers and uh, uh, you know you were like Prince was number one for Creep and you're like going because you do think you're in Ireland in your little house going putting like because you were there in band camp somebody asked for it you send it they don't believe it's you sending mm. it signed you're like of course it's me who the <laughs> hell do you think is doing this stuff and in many ways maybe it was okay to be someone who's kind of under the radar because you know <clears throat> I always thought oh god you know of course you know like say you've done that reality TV and that you know you were saying about the thing with fame and how much bigger it makes you You, in one way you need to be known more to get people to come to the gig and then I'm, maybe I'm at the stage in my life I want to hide anyway so you know the like I was thinking to myself recently why am I going back to Edinburgh I used to go because I wanted to you have a cli like as a performer you're climbing climbing and then you go well is it a, is it a climbing or is it a is it a is it a wheel that I'm on now like the same thing because like you've done what you want to do you only go back if you really want to sing and see the people who've come to the gigs and um, I suppose it's the same uh, like the idea that you see people who are amazing recording artists and then you realize god what are they doing now if they're not because they're pop stars they can only go so far mm -hmm. so w one of these sorry tangentially bring it back to this woman i'd seen when i was in dublin agnes burnell who was in her 70s it was like an incredible singer of those kurt Vile songs i think she was the one who made me go god look it's not about sexiness or enigmaticness or like your age it's she could do be till a hundred and and she transform mm -hmm. herself and i believe her you know have so. you referred to her in previous interviews uh, as having a cigarette and a whiskey yeah so and she's the one and she really i'm imagining marianne faithful to be yeah honest. no That's absolutely i mean of of that type and ear like completely and she 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 had the most beautiful like incredible eyes um i think she was the one who played salome naked first in london like she was a big star oh. in in um, like in the West End first, and she'd come from Berlin. Her father Benar owned the old um, kind of uh, Berlin theatres, and Marlon Dietrich knew her when she was a younger girl. And then she escaped from there and was working kind of like for Secret Service, Vicky Three Kisses on the radio, <laughs> where they'd be sending messages out for the people to kind of like um, disrupt the German army. But she ended up, I think Tom Waits even wrote for her and Mark Almond was inspired by her, but she used to work in the club we worked in. And I just remember thinking, she's everything. She's like a young girl, she's like a man. She's like, I suppose that's, and she, she that with this mad venue, like had all these youngsters drinking their heads off. And in Ireland, when you're drinking your head off, if I'm saying that, it was pretty mental. There was bottles flying <laughs> everywhere, but they would be still and respectful for her. And um, that's powerful. Oh, it was powerful. And so when I did, like, we were supposed to work together after that conversation, I had saying, Oh, God, like, how did you start? And I'm not trained. And I still remember it, like, her with her cigarette and whiskey. And I was thinking, There's hope for me yet because that's the type of singer I'm, you know, I was smoking a lot at that stage. What was it she said? It was, I, I, again, yeah, better, I think I, yeah. it's that you don't need to be a singer. You need to be a performer. Yeah, yeah. Perf be a better actor, or a storyteller, or performer. And she said it's not about how well you sing the song, and that was a real wake-up call for me because then I suppose it made me think of Dylan, and Cave, and <clears throat> Waits, and everybody who's singing their own voice. So that set me up on a journey too to go, what is my voice? Like, what is my voice? Not just I've learnt how to sing like Ella Fitzgerald or whatever. So that's why I always love those kind of songs where you sing, speak it, and that I like a bit of kind of that you use your own accent or whatever. And I love singers who sing. I love all types of music. I love them when they sing really well. I just know that I can't do that necessarily. But anyway, when she passed away, I think that felt, you know, th certain people in your life you meet who are like mentors. And I just felt not like a baton. You know, it wasn't her baton to pass on to me. But she was the woman I... I had heard look mummy mm -hmm. from first and I did ask her could I sing it and she did say you know because I said look I'd really love to sing that mm -hmm. so that was the first time I'd ever heard it and we were supposed to be working together up until her death and um, I mean it was like it was a week or two away like she was hilarious she was always escape when she was in hospitals before always escaping to be out on stage and I became very good friends with her children um, who were very supportive of what I was doing and then there was an evening that we did of her that um, uh, we had an old tape cassette November 26 whatever 93 which was the name of the show and then we had I, I, I did the kind of songs 
um, and then we had her speaking and her piano player in between and so it was kind of you know this thing uh, of uh, kind of paying tribute to her and uh, sort of evoking her yeah and so she, so she was just and she was wild like I don't think it'd be as wild as her <laughs> but she really like there's this book called um, oh god Lost Palace or something The Fun Palace and it goes up to the time she's lying in her bed after her husband's had a, an affair with somebody and she's going to be kicked out of the castle Castle Leslie where Paul McCartney got married but she had like you know, fairies of a class from Bulo, you know, they, it's like mad stuff. Like you couldn't, I, when I read it, I thought it's made up. Then I thought, nah, she would have lived this life, you know. People should read it because, you know, people like that. Fun Palace. The Fun Palace. And, you know, I always think, you know, it's kind of like paying the Spiegel to I remember, kind of think, imagine all the people who ever came before here and we follow in their footsteps. And in a way, you know, <clears throat> you like to think what you're doing is unique. But a lot of the time, you've been inspired by somebody or whatever. And I always think if I'd never met her, would I have ever become that kind of singer? Or, you know, so you do, you know, you're, you she's do. In, she's imprinted, uh, 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 well, it's inspired. It's, it is inspiring. inspired. Yeah, and yeah. I suppose like the same way Bowie did or whatever, you know. I remember when Bowie passed away, and I remember I didn't cry for the first year I was, which I thought was a bit, I, when my sister rang me. And I, funnily enough, the night before, I was doing a clique in London, and I, I had listened to, because I thought, I want to hear all the tracks I didn't know of his. So I went through all of them. I got the call the next day. My sister, who was a big fan, who had heard all his stuff, and I didn't do, I didn't cry. Nothing happened, and I thought, what's happening? He was the one I fancied the most in my life. Like, <laughs> I adored him, and then the tears all came later. And then I thought you've got to wear something unusual today and sparkly. You've forgotten how to dress, you know, because you, you become more, nor you know, it's not, you know, you don't because you still look amazing. But, but as time went on, I started being like, not that it was, you know, black clothes, but I was like not bothering. And then I remembered all his style and I thought, it's like when they go. Invigorated you. Yeah, and also because you just remember, you, you I kind of dived into listening to all of his recordings and his interviews and <coughs> then thought, you know, and that's what, like, say, you know, I think you do magical stuff and that's what you want people to do. Uh, like, sometimes when you're gigging after a while, you're like, I, I call it tired pony. You're like, <laughs> I, don't know how, I don't know how to keep going. So COVID kind of was a an awful thing, but a welcome thing. But also it also made me kind of question maybe how much touring how much you know you give your soul over because that's mm. I always believe you give yourself over you do yeah. but uh, you know how much do you want to sell your soul to the devil how much do you want to keep to yourself <laughs> not you know, the audience of the devil but you know the, de I mean. the devil gorgeous devil but also you know if not fitting into the outfits like I was joking last night about being sellotaped in but it's no joke <laughs> like you know <laughs> um, on the subject of David Burry um, yeah. uh, and sort of evoking and, and things I just mm. want to for anyone yeah. listening um, your cover of Rock and Roll Suicide is there's it's on it's on YouTube yeah and it's aud the the audio is amazing but when you pair it with the video yeah there's a real uh it's a real gut punch yeah. of a performance and I just think it's uh incredible that's oh, that thank you that's uh, that, I think that is one of my one of, I think no I'm gonna say that's probably my favorite thing that I've seen you do Great. online in, yeah in, I mean because yeah, yeah. gigs are different because that's an experience but in terms yeah. of things that you can repeat. Watch yeah. that, and that. they're not easy to find online because you'll get a lot of people who say uh, with recordings oh you don't capture what you do in a live show so when you find something that, that yeah. you do well you know that yourself that's always going to be a hard thing I o and you know the worst thing is like you do look back at stuff and go it's a bit like in these shoes or that one you go either I was only singing it for a year so I had a certain instinct or mm. way and then as time goes on you learn it a different way and mm. you don't know how to you don't know how to get back to that mm -hmm. way you, but it captures a, a moment in time a moment in time for sure and um, definitely uh, I always remember hearing that album Ziggy Stardust and Moon Age Daydream and not you know only years later realising his whole connection with the the Braille kind of things of my death in Amsterdam which I love too um, but the the rock and roll suicide like I think I was always remember crying my eyes out listening to that in five years. It was what kind of hearing it through my sister's wall. And 
I don't know. I just feel like an animal singing it. I don't know. I feel like so much kind of. I I always feel like there's an empathy for whoever you're being. It, it, of course, it's you. You know, you're inhabiting songs, and everybody can pretend that you're pretending to be that person, but they're all you, and you're just allowing yourself the excuse because it's somebody else's writing to go. I'm going to be completely evil in this, but it was Nick Cave song. And the thing with the rock and roll is your feeling of someone's pain is your pain but it's their pain so this notion that you know it's it's, it's everybody yeah. you know I mean, so that's what your song it's very shared you know oh, but yeah. if you're not alone yeah uh and it's yeah it's just so i mean uh, please everybody go watch <laughs> it it's it's beyond uh one last thing <laughs> yep. i want to ask before we before we wrap yeah, up you god help you you poor thing because i <laughs> oh, talk no, I've been, this has been an absolute dream for me um nick cave so yep. you've said that you sort of discovered nick cave through a cassette yep. that a friend gave. Yep. And then in, in one interview, you sort of briefly mentioned that you'd met him, but then said nothing more about it. You didn't avoid the subject. You just <laughs> went, oh, you know, because when I met him, because so I saw your Nick Cave show <laughs> yeah. at Brighton Fringe a few years yeah. ago, and um, I kept <laughs> I kept thinking I saw him there. Oh, jeez. But I no, it died. wasn't, but it was because it was I a Nick died. Cave show. There was just lots of men that looked like Oh, Nick my God, Cave. that's so funny. That is hilarious. I've got, um, to, I've got to say that sometime, because that is so funny. It's, I was looking around, I said to Aaron, I went... But well, I've never Aaron. thought of that, that so many people would dress like him. Well, yeah, they're Nick Cave fans, they... Well, <laughs> no, I have... No, so basically, yeah, I got the tape from Justy Mitchell, who is a gorgeous girl from Australia, and we were in college, we were doing the Crucible together, and I think it was his live Bad Seats album, and, she, like, I, you know, was like... I don't know. It was a bit like when I heard Brel. I was like... It's like, not a glove that fits, but you're like... I just love everything about it and I can hear it in my head with Eve at the music and I love the stories and I love the world and you know I sometimes see songs like cinematic things like they're like you're in a in a film or something when you're singing it um so it's like a 3D thing and with him I was just like this is a world I want to live in now it was only a few years later that I started slowly try venturing out a few you know God is in the house and then I'll try Are You The One and I you know I remember the first time hearing Boatman's Call I think my two favourite albums in the world is Boatman's Call and Blood On The Tracks and um, though I can't listen to them all the time because you know listen to them so much you're like oh and I have to give it a few months so I can come back to them but um, I uh, found it you know it was a slow kind of I loved li it's the same thing I love listening to them and then you go now I'm going to try it and um, you know of course they love things like Wild Roses and the PJ Harvey song but I, I try and keep away from those ones because they are so well known and then as time went on the more confidence to try um, some new ones I've made a hames of some of his songs they'll never be heard of again hopefully <laughs> and um, and then the songs that I loved of his like Stagger Lee that you've been a in a you know the rest of the audience like his disciples as he's doing his preaching and you're like oh my god i love that song i can never do that song my mother will have a breakdown if i do that song people will throw me off the stage and then when we were doing the k thing i thought i oh, listen you're old enough now you just got to do that song like it is a terrible uh not it's an amazing song but just the story is terrible but you have to kind of laugh and I mean, joke your way through it that, because that whole album is is nasty songs. it's so nasty and i mean we we did that one in dublin recently it went great but nobody clapped at the end of it like other people usually clap and go crazy now everybody said they loved it but i was going to fergal why was it too he said no i just think they just went oh, jesus i like, don't know what to do this is pretty evil this let's all pretty, just sit yeah, here and yeah. see what happens so anyway so that's the songs and stuff and the feeling of like a very beautiful um, a guy who's written possibly the most beautiful love songs I've ever heard has a spirituality I'm quite I'm not a religious person but I you know I, ha I am on my way I love spirituality so is Fergal and he probably from you know having learnt I, I think recently I, I kind of connected the dots of like I showed Fergal an old church that we had to kind of run in the back lanes up an old Protestant church in a very Catholic town where there was only about six people and everybody was singing out of tune. And I think that love of that type of singing, which always reminds me, I always think Nick Cave songs are like either very sad hymns or crazy hymns, but they're all hymns in my mm. head. And and of course, like, you know, he talks about the, the, the testament. So you're just always thinking there's some kind of, he, you know, he calls it duende, a longing in it, but there's a God-like thing or a yearning in his music. And for me, it's like, 
it's never tiresome to sing because it's it's always something that you feel you never resolve that you're questioning so that was the beginning of that journey and then um uh, meeting him uh, that happened a few times where um i was in i think 2003 we were doing gigs in uh dublin and i was singing a, the dark the, the 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 original dark angel show not the one that i did years later where i changed the whole set list this one was old weimer music mixed with nick cave and mixed with you know david bowie and just trying to make it quite an electric show and shane mcgowan and victoria um his wife uh invited me to go and see the gig he was doing in vicar street he also did a small slot doing um a lovely song uh uh, Dolphins, um, Fred, Fred Neal, um, which was amazing. He was playing so close. Anyway, I ended up having dinner with them, and I, I was in shock. And um, I was around the table. I think Warren was one side, Jim was another. Shane was going on about some, some, like Shane was just embarrassing something about my chest, and Nick was being very kind, going, "Oh, don't mind him." And then he's saying, "You know, I hear you hear my songs, you do my songs," and I was like looking at him like no talking like I couldn't I was like he was you don't talk much and I was like looking looking and getting more drunk just completely terrified staring do you want to sing I'm staring at everybody but also staring mostly at my plate because I was just couldn't (laughs) fucking handle I was in their presence and they were so nice to me and he's saying why don't you sing my songs I was like no way and I remember I don't know if I got sick that night. I, I think I drunk so much because I was so scared, but I was hoping I hadn't made a fool of myself. But I went home and I, I just couldn't speak. So maybe that's why I never talk about it because <laughs> I couldn't speak. He was really lovely. And then years later, meeting him um, with his beautiful wife um, uh, at his Bonnie Monroe uh, in the Roundhouse, they were doing a talk on that. And then he signed uh, my book and he was saying, I heard, you know, people ain't no good. You know, and again, my absolute, you know, for somebody who talks so much rubbish, nothing came like, you know, (laughs) I talked to his wife because I felt like I just thought, oh, don't think I'm a stalker because I, you know, also because Shane and Victoria, Victoria gave me his home phone number. I said, I don't want his home phone number. (laughs) What are going to be? Hello, (laughs) Mrs. Cave. You know, I said, I I love his music, but I'm not, you know, and I thought my stalker factor is good. I have his number. Mm -hmm. I know kind of where they live, but I never have gone near them. You know, it's really hard because I know where they live. Yeah. Occasionally I have to walk past it and I'll sort of peer up into the general area and go, but, there yeah, they are. The not, but you know, it is hard because I am a fan, but I've got to kind of know. And, and then, you know, so, and then another time when they were doing gigs in Latitude, we were allowed on the side of the stage. I mean, he's just always been a very kind um you know, uh, gentle, like in, in my regard. And, and, and as the band said, Jim said, you know, the, uh, people said, you don't mess with the bad seeds, you know. So luckily, and I worked with Jim once where we were writing, kind of trying to write music with each other, but I was so scared of that too. I just ended up hel- helping him with the architecture of his house. <laughs> but they were always really um, lovely. And I think it's just, I think it's really hard meeting people you admire in that way because I want to do justice to their songs. But I'm a bit like freaked out by the whole. I'm, you know, I go like kind of like a ten year old, just like completely, you know. <laughs> they must be going, what is wrong with that person? That's a very pleasant, inter- like having dinner and obviously, you know, there's the the. It fear seemed pleasant, but it was it was <laughs> terrifying. The, the fear of God, you You're know. Right. And I have one last question, yeah. just for my own personal one. You've met many people. Yeah. Have you ever met Tom Waits? Never. I don't think anyone really does. Oh, no, but I tell you, no, they don't. But, um, okay, I did work with this. Okay, there's two things here. I did work with this incredible man. Oh, God. And I can't think of his name because I got fog brain, but he was the most amazing kind of clarinetist and, uh, um, and saxophonist and sadly passed away with an accident over COVID. But he was Tom Waits' um, players on his gigs. And there's another guy, David Coulter, and I just couldn't believe I was working with him because I've heard his music. But a very good, because Kathleen, his wife, um, is was either it's the Rosa Tralee or that's how he names her in his songs. She's Irish. Um, 
uh, he he visits Ireland every now and then on the QT. But my friend Merlo Merlo Kelly Mary Louise, as her full name is, not the wine, um, without the tea, um, she <laughs> rang me in a state outside George's Market having a, a conniption that Tom Waits was inside the record shop and she like, <laughs> I'm outside and he's inside. And I was like, this is the closest I'm going to get. This is the closest <laughs> I'm going to get. And I was seeing his gigs, I think, uh, his uh, gold. Uh, I, I was way oh, at the back. Oh, and doom. I got the ticket, I the cheapest one. I was way at the back. And at the end, I went, God damn it. I went down like halfway and stood. It was incredible. I mean, he is one person. You, I mean, you say about wanting to meet. I have it written down for like 20 years, like buy milk, sort out your weight. Ask Nick Cave and Tom Waits, would they ever write a song or ever sing with me? Things that, you know, <laughs> I'll probably when I'm 80 have the confidence to do. But those are the people like, you know, could you imagine, you know, meeting yeah, him? Yeah, I, it's sort of, there's too much mythos. Yeah. Um, so and that was the closest. That, let's put it down. If we have to put one each, you, do you want Nick and I'll take Tom? Yeah. Okay, we're putting that out to the universe. Uh, Camille, this has been such a pleasure. Yeah, Thank absolutely. you so much for joining now me. Now I want us to perform together. That'll oh, be the scary one. Oh, no, I'd love to. Let's do it. Yeah. Let's see if the tent's free now. Yeah. They've got the piano. <laughs> we'll do it. All right. Thank you very much, Camille O'Sullivan. Thank you so much, darling. And that was Camille O'Sullivan. My God, I love that woman. What some wonderful, wonderful stories. Um, I, again, if you are not familiar with her, please um, look up her work. She is uh, amazing. Uh, I'm such a big fan. Um, and honoured we had the chance to have a chat. Anyway, uh, as I said before at the beginning, uh, come see me on tour in October and November across the UK and Ireland for my show. Uh, I said it again. My show <laughs> club cataclysm. I'm doing the reason I can't talk very well is because I do have a cat that is still just walking around. And do you want to hear? Try and hear the purring again. That purring, and he's rubbing himself against the microphone. Go on, Egon. <laughs> I hope you like it. Um, also, he farts when he's really happy, um, and I just got a whiff. Uh, <laughs> um, thank you very much, you gorgeous listeners. Please be sure to review. Lovely five stars, unless ten is an option. Uh, and uh, subscribe, all of that nonsense. We'll be back next week with a absolutely stunning guest. Uh, goodbye!